back at the week in news with some strong language now on BBC One. Later than build, I do hope they've got enough to talk about. Um, I feel the reflection's really strange. I can see your body, but my face. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a dream come true. The dream combination. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Ramesh Ranganathan. In the news this week, in Florida, there's a nightmare for one salon owner after accidentally leaves the door open during President Trump's latest back sack and crack. <laughs> <laughs> in Paris, there's growing tension as the head of French military intelligence realises he's accidentally activated his exploding pen. And as a vaccine is rolled out in Britain, a relieved Matt Hancock takes his staff for a quiet celebratory drink. <laughs> On Ian's team tonight is an artist who says he has only dressed as a woman three times since March. Mate, I've only dressed three times since March. <laughs> Please welcome Grayson Perry. And with Paul tonight is a broadcaster who presents Radio 4's Museum of Curiosity. Oh, I wonder what that's all about. Uh, please welcome Alice Levine. <laughs> so, we begin with the bigger news stories of the week. Uh, Ian and Grayson, have a look at this. Something very fishy, the Prime Minister. <laughs> uh, there's Monsieur Barnier doing a backward selfie. <laughs> Yeah, that's how scary it is. <laughs> <laughs> He's bitten off more than he can chew. Yeah. <laughs> is there any jokes left about Brexit? I don't know. I mean, that's the one thing that's run out now, isn't it? Let's oh, hope so. Well, given that you've come as Mrs Thatcher... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how old-fashioned this feels now. In the history of the world, has there been any process that has been sort of so kind of self-sabotaged and useless... You've got a fly on you. Square one. You've got a fly here. Have I? <laughs> oh, my God, a Mike Pence. I'm so sorry, <laughs> mate. Every, every now and again, we get a pro-Brexit fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where was I? I was... Uh, I, know, I was... We were establishing a no-fly zone. <laughs> Come on! Wow! <laughs> yes! Quality marks on that joke there, Paul. <laughs> you no, know, after 30 years, Ian has justified his appearance in the programme. <laughs> Well, then you can follow suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is the alarming spike in news reports about Brexit, which has left most of the country struggling to stay engaged. <laughs> <laughs> he is the spirit animal of the present sort of situation, isn't he, yes. Brexit-wise? It's a shame he doesn't fall over. I think he's done all the hard work. <laughs> uh, well, the good news is this is the last show in the series, so you won't have to talk about it after tonight. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. So <laughs> the next series, it won't be an issue. <laughs> we'll be importing all the jokes from Germany next time. <laughs> Has anyone got any feelings about what might happen? It's either a brilliant deal delivered by Boris in triumph, or it isn't. <laughs> I, I can't guess at the moment. I literally yeah. don't know. You but he's had dinner with a blonde, so that's a big plus. <laughs> we were supposed to read into what was on the menu, weren't we, with uh, Boris and Ursula? We were supposed to read into what, what the items on each course were and they had some kind of hidden meaning. They were yes. supposed to be metaphors. So if he ate the second scallop, what does it mean? <laughs> like, oh, is, that, yeah. is, that, is that preferable for us, for them? I do you think it's just because they, they keep forgetting what they're meant to be negotiating? <laughs> so they have a, a fish course. So they go, oh, fishy, fishy, fishy. <laughs> <laughs> fish. 
The waiter's an immigrant. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did Boris get himself in trouble as soon as he arrived in Brussels? Was this the mask etiquette situation? Have a look at this. Do you think I'm masked off, actually, Um, I... Well, if, if we... Would you just... Yeah. Okay, yeah. mask off. And then you can take it. How are you? Good evening, everybody. So, what I then we're we'll putting back on. Let's put it back on yeah, immediately. Put it back yeah, right. on immediately. So, no chance. You're on a tight ship here. Yeah, you're yeah, quite tight, too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I love that Boris's whole thing is that he doesn't want to be bossed around by the EU. <laughs> <And then that's laughs> a, a whole protracted monologue where he gets completely told, yeah. But I think it's been cool. unfairly edited. It made him look like a buffoon out of his deck. <laughs> And her telling him that he had to keep at least ten foot away. I mean, it's nothing to do with COVID, it's just general. <laughs> Are we surprised that the negotiations have reached a crisis point? People should be surprised. They spent years saying this would be an easy deal, it's oven ready. Yeah. It's only oven ready in the sense of all the ingredients are on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Boris Johnson definitely did think it was going to be easier than it has been. Uh, have a look at this. We have a deal with the EU that is ready to go. This is the oven ready pie. We've got an oven ready deal. Put it in the microwave. It is oven ready. Whack it in. Gas mark one. I'm not, I'm not a great cook. <laughs> Clearly. I don't think you have gas mark one on a microwave, do you? <laughs> I feel like it keeps bouncing off the cellophane if it's microwave ready. That's what's happening. You just can't actually get into the dish. Prick with a fork. <laughs> That's what you do with a microwave. <laughs> According to The Sun, who does Michael Gove call the Sausage King? <laughs> Duke of Cumberland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wasting my time here, you know. It's an affectionate term he uses for the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Boris Johnson being called the Sausage King is like one of those nicknames that he'd pretend he doesn't like, but he really <laughs> loves. You know, really just, oh, stop, oh, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> All those people that give themselves a nickname, everyone's calling me the Sausage King. No one's calling you the Sausage King. <laughs> It's actually the yeah. Slovakian EU yeah. Vice President, Marko Sefcovic. Uh, oh, yes. I was about to say that. Yeah. Because he's enabled the sale of sausages across the border in Ireland. He's done a bit of negotiation just to prove that these things can be done. Yeah, there was a mini sausage war. That sounds like something that happens at a cocktail party, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, exactly. The well, sausage is a full size. Yes. The war, the war is mini. Yeah. Was that a bit like the cheese and pineapple war of 1853? Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> exactly the one. You're absolutely right. They never signed a treaty on that either. <laughs> no. <laughs> what have the Office for Budget Responsibility predicted if there's a no deal Brexit? Those guys are wild, by the way. Oh, crazy. <laughs> one of them, nickname, the Sausage King. <laughs> Uh, is that a 20% drop in GDP? Like a massive economic consequences from a no deal for us in Britain? Yes, well, uh, it's predicted that it apparently would hammer manufacturing, financial services and agriculture, which is OK, obviously, because uh, we've got the hospitality and retail industry to keep... <laughs> <laughs> That's dark. That is really dark. <laughs> what has uh, prominent Brexit supporter Sir Jim Ratcliffe done for British jobs this week? He's moved his company from Wales to France. He's uh, given the jobs to France. Ratcliffe, who has often proclaimed the benefits of leaving the EU, as you said, has decided to site his new car manufacturing plant in France rather than Bridge End in Wales, which he previously suggested. He said France is better situated <laughs> with access to foreign markets. <laughs> <laughs> he makes a 4x4 four four vehicle called the Grenadier. So the Grenadier, I think, is meant to suggest British valour over the years. Mm -hmm which didn't usually involve running away to France. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it, it, look, it just feels like, you know, we're all being put out of a job there. It feels like the politicians and businessmen are having a deep irony competition with each other. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm just looking forward to what he renames right. the Grenadier. I mean, it's presumably the Imperial Napoleonic Guard. <laughs> <laughs> Vehicle. <laughs> OK, so this is the return of Brexit, the topic which, back last January, had everyone moaning, I wish something else would dominate the news. <laughs> <laughs> On 
Wednesday night, Boris was in Brussels for urgent talks with Ursula von der Leyen. This occurred following days of tense negotiations, after which Carrie finally agreed he could have dinner with another woman. <laughs> <laughs> the government's nightmare scenario squad has listed what could lie in store for the UK this winter, including no-deal gridlock in Kent, heavy flooding in rural areas, a massive spike in COVID cases, and a happy new year. <laughs> Paul and Alice, take a look at this. Right, yes, uh, Matt Hancock, I think I've been told he is. This is the uh, vaccine arriving. Uh, the dogs are being encouraged to vaccinate people. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he's been vaccinated by a dog and he's very happy about it. Never trust a doctor with a bow tie. And uh, they've mixed up the, the vaccine with the Vi Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the vaccine has arrived. We are the first country in the world to start injecting it into people. The dogs are very happy to come in and help because the <laughs> NHS is strapped for people. I had my hair cut today because I vowed not to have my hair cut until the first person got the vaccine in, in this country, and so I haven't been cut for about 10 months. Oh, I wondered why. I thought it was because you looked a bit like Steve Bannon. No, it was also... <laughs> no, it was also because I could, Ian. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so this is the news this week that Britons became the first people in the world to be inoculated. The second person to get it was William Shakespeare. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, talk about going for the old people first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maggie Keenan was patient zero, uh, and in keeping with the Shakespeare theme, Maggie Keenan turned out to be a woman being played by a small boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do we know how William Shakespeare made Matt Hancock cry? He, he cried on television. I don't know that he did. I, I feel like well, what do you think? a kind of sort of side hustle that Pfizer had was to create some sort of saline solution that could look like real tears to make it look like Matt, Matt Hancock was really quite... Because it almost looked real, didn't yeah. it? Well, let's have a look to see how convincing he was. Just simple words there, reacting it. You're quite emotional about that. Well, it's just... Uh, it's been... You know, it's been such a tough year for so many people and there's William Shakespeare putting it... So simply for everybody that, you know, we can get on with our lives. I can't work out if he's laughing or crying. It doesn't seem... <laughs> well, they're very either. similar, aren't they, laughing and crying? They can be, yes, yeah. but you, usually you're able to determine which one the person is doing. <laughs> yeah. But there's a sort of strange melange of the two. Yeah, I mean, it'd be an absolute nightmare at a funeral, wouldn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> also, the way he wiped away his tear was like he'd never done it before. It was sort of like up and, like, into his hairline. It's like, has this never happened Just to him? save that for later. Yeah, we'll have that and back into the little capsule that they've given me. <laughs> <laughs> I've just had a, I, out of nowhere, I've just had a brilliant business idea. Whoopee graves. Like a whoopee cushion, right? And when the coffin goes down in the grave, it makes a loud farting noise. <laughs> <laughs> no, OK, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got too enthusiastic. That, that would be the appropriate reaction to a whoopee grave, that. Good, good idea. Wrong place. <laughs> we, we sort of needed the second person to get the vaccine to be called William Shakespeare because we needed puns, didn't we? Ne mm. We needed the conspiracy theorists to be able to say much of flu about nothing. Flu gentlemen of Varen. <laughs> it seems no fly zone was quite some time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Blue gentleman of Verona. <laughs> Blue gentleman of Verona. A fart grave whoopee cushion. Yeah, that's my idea. That's my idea. The NHS uh, has asked people not to turn up expecting a vaccine, but how did Martin here get his? Did he get it in a tombola? Uh, he didn't, but I do think vaccination tombolas are a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like you to all note that I came up with that. I think that that sounds like something that Paul's uh, Whoopi Grave company might <laughs> diversify see, into. Everybody's talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> they laughed at me on Dragon's Den, but not laughing now. <laughs> I've got a lot of time for Martin. All he did was call up and ask for one, didn't he? Um, <laughs> very, very politely. Have a look at this. I'd like you to tell us how you came to get the vaccine this morning, how it happened. I rang up uh, Guy's Hospital, which I know very well, so I've lived in London most of my grown-up life, and uh, I said, what's this thing? You're doing the vaccination. They said, yes. And then they spent various times asking me questions about this and that, not very interesting, and I said, yes, no, yes, no. And they said, we'll come at half past 12. Of course, I couldn't damn well find anywhere to park my car, so I was late. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm here now, and... Um, I got inside and they 
duly put me on the list. I went off and had a rather nasty lunch and then came back and um, they were ready for me. I also enjoyed that you said they asked me some not very interesting questions. What did he want? Like, OK, dream dinner party, who would they be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what did we learn this week could be a symptom of long COVID? Loss of sense of humour. <laughs> <laughs> well, one infectious disease expert this week... Yes. ..claimed that erectile dysfunction could be a new side effect of long COVID. Oh, that's just Pfizer trying to get both their drugs in. <laughs> <laughs> that's also just somebody trying to explain something away, surely. <laughs> it's got to be long COVID. It's long COVID, yeah. Ironically named. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of celebrities uh, have lined up to take the vaccine. Who's in? Who's the ideal celebrity to play to the the kind of anti-vaxxer audience? Yeah, you need to pick carefully, don't you? Yeah, you do. So you've got to kind of... If, God, if he's doing it... Then I think we should. About David Icke. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the guy. That's what you need. The lizard king. I mean, whatever. you know, yeah. that would be helpful if he if he went up and and said, "Look, it turns me into a lizard." Well, the Sunday Mirror rounded up a number of vintage A-listers for their lead story. One of the celebrities to say that they would take the jab was Eamon Holmes. The last few weeks have been awful for him. He can't even go down the local pub because they don't have enough food to give him a substantial meal. <laughs> Another age celebrity uh, encouraging the elderly to take the vaccine is Ronnie Wood. Uh, though that's less of a ringing endorsement. He'll take anything through a syringe. <laughs> <laughs> um, while finally, Lulu told the mirror she'd take the vaccine because she didn't want to get COVID and feel unwell. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I haven't been to a gig in months. That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Who was caught flouting the lockdown rules this week? Oh, is it Rita Ora? No, it's the other one, Kate uh, Burley. Yes, that's right, yes. Kate, is it Kate? Kate Burley, Burley yeah. Kate Burley. Sky yeah. News. Yeah, she got caught having a, a, a little dinner with a few uh, colleagues, I think. It's a birthday party. They tried to cover up the fact that they had a party of ten people. It was six at one table and four at the other, and everybody knows that's illegal in Tier 2. They've lost their jobs for six months and three months, unlike some other people. You know, I don't want to bring up Dominic Cummings because it's pathetic to keep bringing him. <laughs> um, so it was her and Beth Rigby. It is their job to get public figures to um, squirm about breaking the rules. If hypocrisy was a crime, <laughs> you'd yeah. get suspended. We'd for six all be months. in prison. Yeah. Have a look at this unbelievable clip. Um, the point I'm making. Uh, the, the, the point is you're making. The point you're making screaming is screaming at the telly yeah. saying. It's one rule for us and it's one rule for them. And, and you're, you're falling into that trap. She's, she did say one rule for us, though, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> so she did include herself in yeah, that. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, now, Grayson, COVID gets a lot of stick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfairly so. Yeah, I think some, it's all been very one-sided, to yeah, be honest no, with I you. know where this is going. I don't want to talk about it. OK, cool. <laughs> My words were taken out of context. I oh, really? That's what I can say. Yeah. Well, OK, so what the question was alluding to was... <laughs> <laughs> you gave a full Thatcher glare there. It was scary. We can clear this up. Uh, well, you said that COVID-19 will help the art sector get rid of dead wood. Were, were your words taken out of context? Yes, they were. And some <laughs> PR went <laughs> mad <laughs> all over it and they got on my <laughs> fucking <laughs> tits. <laughs> be difficult to cut around. Yeah, that yeah. is... <laughs> I, can see, I can see that. That's... <laughs> so, this is the rollout of the COVID vaccine, uh, starting with the most elderly. Uh, this is a real boost for care homes, but a real blow for my mum, who's lost her last excuse not to go in one. Um... <laughs> uh, talking about the vaccine rollout on Good Morning Britain, Matt Hancock broke down in tears. Matt Hancock went on to say that despite us having a vaccine, let's not blow it now. Well said, Matt. It would be <laughs> awful if we somehow blew it and ended up with one of the worst mortality rates in the world and a test and trace system runoff XL. <laughs> After she was caught breaking COVID restrictions on a night out, Sky bosses said that Kay Burley wasn't out of the woods yet. Oh, come on, Kay, not dogging as well. <laughs> <laughs> And so to round two. I'm very excited about this, by the way. Yes. It's time for the snow globe of news. Oh, you treat us. Ah, it's the snow globe of news. Fingers on the buzzers, teams. Oh, this is so Christmassy. 
Yes, Grace. Uh, this is the news that a campaign has been waged by the good women of my home county to have the, the, the phrase Essex girl removed from the dictionary because it has a derogatory meaning. Mm -hmm. Mike stilettos, a lot of tan, uh, and kind of likes a cocktail, likes a day glow cocktail or seven. I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I am an Essex girl. I will, I will celebrate it. Good on them. Uh, In fact, well, I think it should be a treasured. I think, I think we should immediately get onto UNESCO now. <laughs> Grace, you're absolutely right. This is the news that Oxford University Press has finally agreed to actually change its definition of women from Essex. So that's famous Essex girl Gemma Collins there. Do we know what she thinks of the dictionary? The dictionary is a wonderful book because you can just, you know, move the words in any order and create whatever store you like. You want to copyright that idea? <laughs> I've got enough on me plate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it keeps getting mentioned because I might seriously take this up as a business because <laughs> this amount of advertising would cost me millions normally. <laughs> But the truth is, Gemma Collins is actually a big fan of the dictionary. Have a look and see what you think. It is absolutely outrageous in today's society that the dictionary, which I'm a massive fan of the dictionary, you know, we should be, like, promoting the dictionary anyway because, like, it is such an amazing, like, historical British thing, isn't it? <laughs> You can see Samuel Johnson just turning in his grave with pleasure. <laughs> don't, well, don't, you know, don't. you know what's put a smile on his face. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly if Boswell was there to describe it. Yeah. So, in an edition of the dictionary designed for foreign learners, Essex girls are described as not intelligent, dress badly, talk in a loud and ugly way, <laughs> and are very willing to have sex. <laughs> That's, that's a bit much, isn't it? Yeah. It's a bit much. It's foreign learners turning up going, this is going to be incredible. <laughs> <laughs> In other news, Nigella Lawson was mocked for her pronunciation this week. You know? Oh, yes. This is very Hyacinth Bucket. Or Hyacinth Bouquet. It is, yeah. Now, I'm aiming for quite a solid mash at this stage, but I still need a bit of milk, full fat, which I've warmed in the micro wave. <laughs> <laughs> no, she, that's a deliberate joke, isn't it? It's, it's a joke to order to sort of, like, get a publicity on a show like this. I, no. I, I, I mean, people sure will, st will, will stoop to such elements like that just to publicise whatever business they're in, <laughs> I think. Croave. <laughs> <laughs> like saying whoopee cushione. <laughs> OK, so this is the news that an insulting definition of Essex girls has been removed from the dictionary. Listen, I know I shouldn't use this programme as a soapbox, but... As a member of a minority myself, I think it's brilliant this country is finally dealing with the historic oppression of white people in Chelmsford. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, fingers on buzzers, teams. <laughs> is this about social distancing, by any chance? No, it's not about social distancing. All right, OK. <laughs> I didn't know Father Christmas was married. <laughs> Got a wedding ring on. Mrs. Claus. Yeah, to Mrs. Christmas. You didn't know... Mrs. Claus, Mrs. Christmas. Yeah. Are you being serious? Yeah, I never... Wait, what does she do, then? Does she do a lot of the rapping? <laughs> uh, well, this is actually the news that yeah. even Christmas can't improve the dumpster fire that is 2020. Uh, every year, somewhere promises a Christmas wonderland only to under-deliver in spectacularly bleak circumstances. Where was that this year? Is it Britain? <laughs> It's actually Santa's magical drive through adventure in Hull. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise. One parent uh, basically complained about the presence of the Christmas Grinch, uh, who sort of stalks your car for a bit, <laughs> whilst another described him as making them feel like they were in one of those horror walkthrough things. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he's not that bad. Oh, <laughs> my God. He looks like what people are scared of what might happen if you take the vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know what happened to Mrs Claus? Well... <laughs> up to a few minutes ago, I didn't know anything of her existence, so... Um... Organisers revealed that she didn't turn up because she missed her bus. <laughs> um, adding, I had to get someone else into the costume, which may explain why one parent told the Daily Mail that Mrs Claus was stood there with her right face on doing nothing. <laughs> 
What expensive Christmas mistake did Hartlepool resident Ray Liddell make this week? Is it something to do with Christmas lights outside his house? He ordered this inflatable Grinch online, but he didn't realise it was actually this big. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a huge house, thank goodness. Yes. Well, we don't know, that might be normal size, he might live in a doll's house. <laughs> <laughs> In other news, according to the Sunday Telegraph, because of COVID, several companies have launched Santa on Zoom initiatives, including one in Finland which costs £71 for five minutes. Ow. Of which the first four minutes are spent with the desperate child shouting, Santa, you're on mute! <laughs> on mute! <laughs> Bottom left! Bottom left! <laughs> uh, every Christmas, the role of Santa is traditionally taken by out-of-work actors. So, as you can imagine, this year the auditioning process has been really competitive. <laughs> Mark Rylance only got down to the final three at Harrods. <laughs> Time now for the missing words round. And we start with surprise as Alfred Hitchcock turns up what? First in queue for the vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> There's no missing word. <laughs> <laughs> turns up his nose at rhubarb pudding. <laughs> turns up trousers. <laughs> <laughs> surprise as Alfred Hitchcock turns up on Belly of Cat. <laughs> this week, Daisy the New York Cat hit the headlines for her unusual markings that resemble the film director. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. It, oh, yeah. wow. I mean, never mind Hitchcock. What's he doing staring at ex-Soviet leader Brezhnev? <laughs> <laughs> Next, Olympics branded a mockery after inclusion of what for 2024 Paris Games? Sarcasm. <laughs> Connect Four. Uh, oh, I know this. This is yeah. breakdancing. It is breakdancing. Olympics <laughs> branded a mockery after inclusion of breakdancing for 2024 Paris Games. Uh, this week, Olympics organisers shocked the world by announcing that breakdancing would become an Olympic sport. And in another change of tradition, instead of a medal, the winner gets a gold chain. Um, <laughs> and finally, audio for controversial sex scene in The Archers <laughs> was made using what? Genuine audio from a sex scene. <laughs> no, no. A bar of soap, a double-decker bus and a pot of jam. <laughs> You're actually not... Yeah. What do you mean I'm not it's far just, off? It's, it's <laughs> was made using a baking tray and some baby lotion. The mind boggles. Mm. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the actors involved said all the squishy noises were done using baby lotion, while I said silly lines of dialogue that led you to believe the soap was in an interesting place. <laughs> oh. It definitely wasn't. It was in an episode of The Art. <laughs> <laughs> so, the final scores are... Ian and Grayson have five, oh. and Paul and Alice have seven. Well, I'm sorry, well done. Grayson. Well done. But before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. Essex Skell gets revenge on compiler of Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Next. I'm knocking off your missus. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get invited to Kay Burley's party? <laughs> <laughs> on which note, we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Grayson Perry, Paul Merton and Alice Levine. And I'll leave you with news that in Downing Street, Jonathan Van Tam tries to leave with the evidence after accidentally sitting on Carrie Simmons' pet hamster. <laughs> <laughs> Just as the Duke of Edinburgh settles down to watch the racing, his tab of acid kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> and in London, after ten months, Paul Merton gets his hair cut. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>Plenty more where that came from. Join the newscast panel, keeping you up to date with all things political, available now on BBC Sounds. Some of my Desert Island dinner party guests coming up on The Graham Norton Show. Jennifer Saunders, Lee Mack and Claudia Winkleman drop by at 10.45. That's coming up after the news. Who's your 2020 hero? It's a year to remember for so